Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Now, today we'll cover the first half of the final chapter of the book of Philippians. Let's first do a little bit of a review. You recall that Apostle Paul is sending this letter, this epistle, to the church that he had founded some 10 years earlier in a town called Philippi in the northern eastern part of Greece. Paul is about 750 miles to the west away in Rome where he's under arrest and chains. Rather than being concerned about his well-being, if you will, he's concerned about this church. There's disharmony within the church in Philippi among some of its leaders. In chapter 2, verse 14, he told us that folks in the church are grumbling and arguing. So he's writing this letter for two purposes. To extend his appreciation for the love and support they've sent him. And it's also a letter of instruction to them about their, quote, unrest. This grumbling and arguing has caused a divide in the church. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Paul sees, though, this source of their problem is their attitude. We have an attitude issue, a mindset issue. This challenge has robbed them of their peace and their joy. Rather than having fellowship and unity of purpose, there's tension, there's bitterness, there's disunity. Paul warns them that the wrong attitude can harm any family. It can leave you vulnerable to deep, more deep problems. This was a good church. Paul tells us they were faithful believers. Paul doesn't point to any morality issues or doctrinal issues. No, this is just a simple feud between two respected leaders who have dug into their positions and their friends and associates have lined up beside them so you've got two conflicting groups just causing this unrest. The seed is a selfish attitude. So Paul's more concerned with the attitude than the argument. He tells them, these leaders, that they're spiritually immature. They are walking around, if you will, like teenagers sulking in a state of discontent. In verse 5, chapter 2, he challenged them. He said, in our relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ. And then in 2.15 he even said, rather than whine, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should shine like stars. Wine or shine, that's the choices. <clears throat> A wise elderly pastor once said, if Christians spend more time praying, or excuse me, as much time praying as they do grumbling, they would have very little to grumble about. That's what Paul's going to teach us in this first part of this chapter. Whining and grumbling is a focus on self. It's a pride issue. It's a heart pride issue. Proverbs 23, 7 said, As he thinks within himself, so he is. How we think on the inside results in how we behave on the outside. So Paul is asking them and us to stop and look in the mirror, to reflect, and ask the question, <clears throat> are we modeling Christ's love? Remember the definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, chapter 13? Love is not self-seeking. It does not keep score. It trusts. It endures. This is agape love. A love that doesn't depend on the other person's behavior. You and I as Christian brothers and sisters are called to love our neighbors. Not because they deserve it, but because we strive to model Christ, who gives us unconditional love no matter whether we deserve it or not. It does not mean we never disagree. A loving husband and wife 
can disagree. But Paul's argument is, just because you disagree does not give you a license, a right, to have a disagreeable attitude, to be sulking and whining and grumbling and negative. And he's teaching them and us that our attitude is a choice every day, every moment. Either we have an attitude of Christ or a self-seeking attitude. And that latter breaks the fellowship with God. That's when we stop listening to his voice. Paul told them that the true source of your bad attitude is your pride. In verse 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Selfish ambition and vain conceit, pride. They're very often the primary cause of divorce. Failed businesses, divided churches. But sometimes we see these words, but we really don't define them, especially in scripture, or even in our own language. What is pride? <clears throat> Where does it come from? It comes from the heart, but secular psychologists define pride as an irrational sense of self. A prideful person has an attitude that is irrational because they even believe themselves as inflated or deflated, and that deflated causes insecurity. They are always comparing, worried, anxious about what others think. Therefore, their feelings are dependent on the opinion of others. A prideful person is always searching for that acknowledgement, that recognition, that praise. He only cares about his agenda, his rights, his feelings. It's sad. You know, the great theologian that I've quoted perhaps too often is C.S. Lewis said, Pride is a spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love, of contentment, of common sense. He went on to say that pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only from having something more than the next person. And lastly, he said, he warned, pride is the single fault which we are most unconscious of in ourselves. So what is the opposite of pride? Humility. Humility. Another word that we often kind of underrate or misunderstand. Again, the secular psychologists tell us it's a sense of emotional autonomy. It's a freedom from the control of the competitive comparing reflex. A humble person is a person of courage, of freedom. They're not worried about other people's opinion. Their self-worth is not wrapped up on other people's dependent. They're not dependent, they're independent, they're autonomous from. They're secure. In the Christian faith, humility is those that are secure because they know that they're loved by God. Their value is based on that unconditional love. It's based on the precious price that we were bought for by Christ Jesus. He paid on the cross. So Paul is warning these, these, these respected leaders, these feuding leaders, that their pride is preventing them not only from their joy and their peace, but also gaining spiritual wisdom and maturity. A humble person is open to hear, to learn, to admit mistakes, and to grow. A prideful person is closed, thinking, I'm good enough. In fact, I'm better than most. Proverbs 11.2 Pride leads to disgrace, but humility comes wisdom. With humility comes wisdom. Let's begin the first verse in chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, in this way, dear friends. When we see that word, therefore, as therefore a reason, Paul is simply referring back 
to the other two chapters that preceded this, the chapters on instructions, because he's starting to summarize what he's said, as we just reviewed previously. Paul begins with a heartfelt, I love you, and I miss you. This agape love is something that comes from Paul's Christ-like heart. It's a heart that we all have, all brothers and sisters. It was a gift when we were born again and rebirth, along with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. This love is the first of the nine fruits of the Spirit spoken about in the book of Galatians. Paul saying, I love you, I miss you, and even the thought of you brings me joy. This word joy is a powerful theme throughout this book of Philippians. Joy, again, is a fruit of the Spirit. It cannot be achieved apart from the Spirit of God. Paul is in chains. He's, about, he's, he's, he's awaiting his fate, a potential death. Yet his heart is not anxious, frightened, is full of peace and joy. Not because of his circumstances, but because of his faith, his trust, his relationship with Christ. He's full of peace and joy. He'll speak more about peace in chapter, excuse me, verse six and seven. What peace is this? Peace occurs in the, when we're absent from being afraid and anxious and prideful. But joy is peace plus. Joy comes after the peace. And those Paul gets his peace from his trust in Christ Jesus, from the Prince of Peace. But by walking with Christ, doing life with Christ, that brings him joy by seeing God at work. That's in Romans 15, 13, Paul said, May God fill you with all joy and all peace in believing in faith. He's, he's, he's joyous about these people because he's seen what God's done in their lives. He's been a part of their growth. He's like a mom and dad that's proud. This Philippian church was the first church that he had founded in the, on European soil, in the Gentile regions. He calls them their, his crown. It literally means a judgment. He'll be standing before Christ, and they'll be his crowning achievement because he, he's going to be in celebration with them at that, in heaven. And he adds this request to them. He said earlier, make my joy complete by saying the same thing, to stand firm, to finish strong, be rooted in Christ. It's a repeat of the verse in the first chapter in 27. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, worthy of Christ. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of Christ, so that I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with what? The mindset of Christ. Now in the next verse, Paul's gonna get a little personal. He's literally gonna call out these leaders by name because they're not standing firm. They're not standing in one spirit. They're not demonstrating the attitude of Christ. Instead, they're arguing, arguing, grumbling, and feuding with fellow believers, creating discourse within the church, robbing that peace and joy that he wants them to have, like his kids. These are good, these are good respected leaders, pillars of the church. Paul's gonna say that they were warriors with him in building the church which makes it even more heartbreaking because they have such respect. That's why there's such a wedge driven between these two. Let's look at verse two. I plead with Odia and I plead with Sintaiji to be of the same mind. I'm asking you two to settle your differences, but to first come together in the same mind as Christ, to restore that attitude of love. Paul doesn't dive into the argument, he dives into their attitude first. In the next verse, he's gonna talk about how to find a way out of this, how to get to reconciliation. He's basically saying first though, you don't have a right 
to be toxic to one another. You're to treat God's children with respect and to honor them. Not because they deserve it, but because that's the attitude of Christ. That's in alignment with Christ's mindset. In the next verse, he'll talk about the disagreement. He doesn't simply ignore it, but he's asking them to first put their pride aside and then humbly submit to this third party arbiter he's going to talk about. Someone that they both know and respect, who Paul calls a, quote, yoke fellow, which we'll talk about. It's through that third party that, with Christ's support, they'll find an equitable solution. But the first step is their mindset. Let's look at verse 3. Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these, these two women, since they have contended, they have worked by my side in the cause of the gospel. They've been warriors with me, co-equals, along with Clement, who is also a worker, and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life, meaning that they're brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, Paul's making it clear that these two women are, are, are to be respected. They're, he has love for them. They're his co-workers. They're warriors. They deserve a well-deserved reputation, along with his fellow Clement. I've been faithful. The, meaning they're in the book of life, meaning that they're saved followers of Christ. But even followers of Christ can get off, off track, get out of their lane. Paul, so Paul recommends this third party. He doesn't give us the name. He calls him a yoke fellow, someone that can, can be harnessed and work together. Someone that's respected in the church. That's known by Paul, known by these ladies. Confidentiality. They'll walk them through to find that reconciliation. The person says, he tells the person to offer, quote, help. That literally means to hold their hand through this process, to give them godly counsel. Paul doesn't ask them simply, okay, kiss and make up. He understands truth matters. He understands that these hurts need processing, need healing. They need reconciliation and forgiveness. Paul understands that any family has disagreements, but the disagreement should not get personal. We shouldn't stop listening to each other or not caring for each other, or certainly not listen, stop listening to God, and not rob us of our peace and joy. Paul is recommending that this true, true, it says, fellow believer, meaning true meaning that it's genuine, meaning that he's mature in Christ and spirit-led, that he will listen and hold their hand, work through the differences in Christ to find an agreement. Often, when we first have these conf these counselings, we first agree on what we agree on, which is our faith. Then all of a sudden, the other things seem so much smaller and easier to resolve in love. In the next verse, Paul's going to return to this theme of, of joy. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 3, remember he said, Dear brothers and sisters, I never get tired of telling you to rejoice in the Lord. And by doing so, it will safeguard you from stumbling. So here he's saying to these ladies in verse 4, let's take a look. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Then in verse 5, let your gentleness, another fruit of the Spirit, be evident to all. The Lord is near. I love the way the New Living Translation translates verse 5. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is soon coming. Paul calls them to restore their joy. How? In the Lord. By trusting in Christ, that way they establish their peace, then they begin to experience his joy. He calls them to bear another fruit of the Spirit in addition to love, peace, and joy. Gentleness as opposed to harshness. Gentleness is again this fruit that comes from love through the Spirit. We're all called to produce it. It could be translated also gracious or forgiving. Grace means unmerited favor. Let your gentleness be evident about how you treat others. 
you have a reputation as a peacemaker rather than a troublemaker. If we did a self-examination of our stubbornness, is it rooted in Christ or is it rooted in pride? Paul is saying we should be known for our fruit. One of the other fruits is kindness, which is love in action. This is the reputation of a person with a Christ-like heart and attitude. A person is considerate, reasonable, caring, humble. They're secure in themselves. They don't need to prove themselves to others. They're not harsh, angry, negative, judgmental, demanding of their rights in every situation. A gentle person is a powerful person. It's a person that also though has peace deep in their soul. And then he reminds them, reminds these leaders and us, the Lord is near. The Lord is coming soon. Do you want to be found when he suddenly appears to be warring with your fellow sister or your brother over some pride issue? He's asking that question. So Paul, overall advice, he's telling them, when you get upset or worried, what do you do? He tells them in verse 6 what you do. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is a powerful and well-used verse. First, you should note that it's a command, not a suggestion. Also, we should be concerned that this notion of worry or anxiety is actually a sin. Why? Because it's the opposite of the trust in God. Worry is a fear of the future, a lack of trust in the sovereignty of God, in the love of God that God always has our best interest, that he's been there for us. He'll continue to be there for us. And that's the two components of prayer, is this thanksgiving, this gratitude, and this faith. We first appreciate what he's done for us and anticipate what he's gonna to continue to do for us. And we're grateful. We place our trust that God is still on the throne, still large and in charge. And as our anxiety decreases with our trust increasing, trust increases, anxiety decreases, and peace is a result. And as we learn to trust him and pray more and more effectively, our eyes and ears begin to open to what's truly important. Prayers don't become monologues, they're two-way communications. We're able to listen to his voice, to get comfort, and direction and discernment and what is the truth in that situation. God's word is a lamp until our feet. God will reorient our mindset or attitude to his perspective on our problem. That's what Paul's referring to in the next verse as we look at verse seven. Let's take a look. And when we go to him in prayer and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul is telling these leaders, once they reconnect with God, their peace will be, destroyed, will be restored and their joy. And this divine peace will not only be, it also be a safeguard. When you and I are full of anxiety, there's this there's this tendency to stumble, to fall into sin. But when we're at peace and in joy and within God's will, bearing fruit, we're safe. You know, peace, the word itself, literally means to restore something that's been broken, to make it whole again, better than new. This is the peace that surpasses all understanding. But, but it doesn't mean that our problems simply just vanish Paul is not speaking about the problem, he's speaking about the worry, this being afraid of the future, looking into the future, not seeing God. You know, the old English word for the root word for worry means to strangle. 
Worry strangles us. It breaks our fellowship with God. Medically, it's been linked. Worry's been linked to headaches and neck pain and ulcers and poor circulation and coordination and decision making. It's just the opposite of what prayer does for us. Prayer is a mighty, beautiful gift from God. That statistically, the, the latest Pew research says that Christians are praying, praying less and less. It's becoming old-fashioned. Prayer is especially declining in our, with our youth in the 18 to 29 year age group. I don't think it's any coincidence that this age group has an exponential growth in anxiety and suicide. These kids are more and more living in isolation, in a social media bubble. They're constantly worried about comparing themselves to the latest trends to be more like the Kardashians of this world. These, these statistics tell us they feel isolated, misunderstood, and have less and less friends. Prayer gives us hope. It gives us companionship. It gives us someone that cares and someone that understands and someone can do something about our problems. Prayer is a true blessing. And talk about medical. It was, it was interesting. The Journal of American Medicine in October 1999 published a, a formal scientific research study on the power of prayer. They researched 1,019 patients who went into this major hospital cardiac care unit with heart problems. They are 50% randomly chosen to be in accessory prayed for and the others were not. Here's a direct quote from the secular professional journal about the results of prayer. Quote, we found that intercessory, intercessory prayer produced measurable improvement in the medical and the medical outcomes of the critically ill, Ill patients. Prayer is such a much better option than worry. And Paul enters the next verse. He starts to close with the word finally. Let's look at verse eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think, meditate, set your mind about such things. What we put in our minds is important to God. What attitude we choose depends on what we put in our minds. Paul is warning us to be careful what we feed our minds, what we dwell on, what we meditate on. He first says it should be true. A survey found that only about 8% of the things we worry about are really legitimate worries. Most of them are not matters that warrant our concern. 92 of them are very low probabilities or we have no control over. Many people are anxious about the upcoming elections. Some worry that a Democrat would be in the White House or a Republican would be in the White House. We can all vote, but worrying about it is just a waste of time. Paul says that the worry simply serves to depress and strangle us. If we focus on the media, which is too often just bad news. We rarely focus on the good. Rather than focusing only on the bad in others, he's saying perhaps we should look at the good in others. He's telling these ladies, you're focused on the other person's flaws, perhaps you consider what's praiseworthy about your sister. Why spend our life searching for things that are negative in every person and every situation? Our heart and mind are like our stomach. You put in good fuel, good results. You put in bad fuel, bad results. We can change our mindset by changing what we consume. Then Paul closes this section. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. 
Paul has repeatedly said that we are to model Christ. Paul's not trying to be, quote, egotistical. He's simply saying, I've tried to do that for 25 years. Paul first met Christ on the Damascus Road 25 years earlier. And he's done his best to model Christ. But he's made it clear he's far from where God wants him to be. He's called himself a wretch. But he's simply saying, if there's something in my walk that's praiseworthy, use it. He's letting them know that he's sitting there in change, awaiting potential death, and telling us he can be at peace and enjoy. He's learned that sincere prayer and an attitude of Christ will produce in a person gentleness, peace, and joy. God bless you. Be safe. We'll finish up next week. Aloha.